Our last speaker today will be Artyom Kosolopov. And while he's setting up, I want to remind everyone not to leave at the end of Artyom's talk because we will be announcing the two outstanding poster awards. One is chosen by the faculty, and one is chosen by all of you. So please stick around after Artyom talk. And Artyom, take it away. Thank you. Let me start off with a small survey. Please raise your hand if you've boiled something today. I, for one, made coffee this morning. OK, how about this week? Maybe you've cooked a meal over the weekend. Still see a few hands down. <laughs> how about in your entire life now? <laughs> right, everyone? OK, obviously, everyone is in this room is familiar with boiling. In fact, humans started to use boiling for cooking as far as 40,000 years ago. However, for centuries, boiling remained as this mundane process that everyone just ignores. I'm here today going to tell you that those tiny bubbles actually have superpowers. Here's an example. Do you know that by using some clever design, you can use boiling to handle the same heat fluxes as exist on the surface of the sun? Well, that sounds like a superpower to me. It's not a secret that the ability of handling high heat fluxes secured a special place for boiling in nuclear industry. Hundreds of nuclear reactors worldwide produce hundreds of gigawatts of clean energy with help of boiling within their cores. However, boiling is also very useful for electronics cooling because boiling can not only handle high heat fluxes, but it can do so while keeping your component at low temperature. And this is precisely what you need for compact and efficient CPUs. Actually, liquid cooling systems that also take advantage of boiling may even allow the industry to keep up with Moore's law for a little bit longer. However, with great power comes great responsibility. And for boiling, it's the responsibility to keep its unstable nature under control. And here what happens when the control is broken. Imagine that you have some very powerful, very intense energy source and you want to cool it down. So what you do, you take a wall, you put your energy source on one side, and you put some water on the other. As the water heats up, you start generating bubbles, and you get some vigorous boiling happening. And it's very nice at removing heat, so you, your system works fine, works exactly as you want, and everything is steady. Until some fluctuation happens within your energy source, and its power rises up. Then what you start seeing that all of a sudden, all of those bubbles, they start clumping together until they form a stable vapor film on top of your wall. And this vapor film, it acts as thermal insulator, preventing energy from reaching water. And since the energy has to go somewhere, it will just go into the wall, increasing its temperature until the whole system just breaks down. This is the phenomenon that we call the boiling crisis. And it defines an absolute maximum of the heat flux that you can push through your system. If you exceed this heat flux, that's what's going to happen, and your system will break down. Boiling crisis is fast, violent, and can be very destructive. This is why we never get even close to the conditions that may cause it. It's also very difficult to predict, making it almost impossible to design some features for your engineering system that can allow you to avoid it. Unless we can find a way around the boiling crisis, we will never be able to use the full advantage, to take the full advantage of the boiling and its potential. And we just might be able to find a solution here. And I believe that the solution lies within the thorough understanding of physics of boiling. However, developing such understanding, it's not an easy task. So let me demonstrate to you why. Here's, sorry. OK, here's the video that I took a few months ago. It shows a small, lonely bubble that is born on the solid wall and then it rises within the pool of stagnant liquid. Don't let that overblown sign on the screen fool you. It's actually about the size of a grain of rice. While this is the simplest boiling situation you can think of, there's already a lot of complicated physics happening there. The size, the shape, and the speed of this bubble, they're all defined by the interaction of multiple forces that act on it. It also depends on other parameters, like the pressure or the temperature of your liquid. There's also something very peculiar about this bubble. Do you notice that it always starts off at exactly the same spot? And this is because bubbles cannot just randomly appear on the surface. They need what we call the nucleation site. 
a tiny imperfection about the size of a red blood cell. And each bubble can be tracked down back to the nucleation site that produced it. However, there is even the third part to this story. As the bubble leaves the surface, it can end up influencing the entire human scale engineering system, such as the nuclear reactor. And all of those scales interact with each other, and each one can influence the other. If you thought that one bubble is complicated enough, how about 10? How about a few hundred? Well, you actually have to think in a range of 100 billion. This is about the number of bubbles you have in a commercial nuclear reactor. Turns out it's roughly the same number as the amount of stars in the Milky Way. And predicting the behavior and the interaction of all of those bubbles is an extremely difficult task. However, we might just be getting on solving it. Every chaotic system has some degree of order to it. And we can see this order if we replicate the chaos within our laboratories and just observe it. This is precisely what we do. We take great care in creating experiments that fully replicate the engineering systems, but only on the laboratory scale. A lot of our, a lot of our designs start as simple as just a sketch on a whiteboard. Then we put the idea through the full 3D CAD accompanied with numerical and analytical system analysis. As the design is complete, we actually have an option of directly 3D printing it within our laboratory, either as a final product or just as a prototype. And then when you have all parts together, you can start an assembly. This entire process is very time consuming and requires a lot of skills from programming to even plumbing. However, it totally pays off by allowing us to observe the phenomena that were never seen in the real life before. However, it's not enough to just have a good experiment. You need special tools to even see what's going on, because most of the information is hidden beyond the limits of human vision. Each bubble, when it's born on the surface, leaves a thermal mark, which can only be seen by the infrared camera. By observing those patterns on the surface, we can infer a lot of important information about boiling. And we can even see the progression of the boiling crisis. That's what you see here now, which allows us to understand how it happens and why it happens. To do so, however, we have to go to some extreme slow-mo. Our infrared cameras record at frame rates of several thousand frames per second. To give you an idea how fast it is, in one frame of this video, the sound waves that I'm creating with my mouth now can only travel to about this distance. But sometimes even this is not enough. Some phenomena happen so fast that we actually have to go to frame rates that are two orders of magnitude higher. This is, for example, a case of the very first stage of the bubble growth, as you can see here. So this video, it was slowed down by almost 5,000 times and takes about one millisecond in the real time. And that's the kind of speeds we need to actually see what's going on there. As a result of our experiment, we generate terabytes of data. But those are not just flashy videos, because each pixel of each frame of those videos contains important information about the boiling process. By developing image processing algorithms based both on the traditional techniques as well as neural networks, our group can uh, find the positions of the nucleation site. We can find shapes and sizes of the bubbles. We can determine what are the frequencies at which those bubbles are produced. And most importantly, we can find the statistical distributions of all of those quantities. And this information is very valuable for our collaboration with the CFD group here in the department because they can use all of those statistical distributions to improve the modeling of boiling heat transfer within the computational fluid dynamics codes. And in the end, finally, when all those things come together, we start to understand how can we tailor our devices in order to achieve the performance that we want. And we can do this, this tailoring on every scale, from designing an optimized spacing between microscopic nucleation sites to inducing some complex vortex flows on the macroscopic level. And we can go even one step beyond. It turns out that certain nanostructures 
may allow us to improve the performance in terms of boiling crisis even further. We can put those structures on top of our boiling surfaces when they act like sponges by pulling the water in and contracting the progression of the boiling crisis. So here, here you have it. Now you know everything you ever wanted to know about boiling. But I don't. There are still a lot of questions unanswered and some things that we are just beginning to understand. And I believe that with the effort that scientists take here at MIT and around the world, soon we'll be able to find the answers to those questions. And finally, use all the superpowers that the boiling has. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Artyom. So we do have time for a couple of questions. What more do you want to know about boiling? <laughs> Thank you. For, oh, yeah, one. What kind of pressures do you guys go to on these experiments? So right now we go up to 10 bar, but uh, this summer we go in all the way to 155 bar, which is reactor pressure. Yeah. How does toroid look? So they look like toroid looks like a reflection. Which one? The, the bubble. The bubble that's going up. This one? Yeah. Well, it first starts as circular, but then as it's going up, it's not toroidal, so there is no, it's, there's no hole in the middle, it's just the reflection. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it? Yeah. Boiling is a phase transition. Yes. Thermodynamically speaking. So your work, which really pertains to looking at the mechanism of all of the movies you showed, sure. would you make contact with thermodynamics, which has been around a long time? Well, every process that we look at during uh, each, each part of the boiling is kind of related to the thermodynamics dynamics because all of them are governed by the conservation of energy, which is uh, uh, our first law. So. I, or you mean more on a system level, on a large scale? What I was thinking of is you would like to be able to predict this critical point that you, you talked about, right? Yes. When the system goes from a liquid to a vapor, yes. that's a transition to the thermodynamic textbooks. But you're now looking at dynamical transition, actually how it happens. So ordinary thermodynamics predicts when it happens. To look up the boiling point of any liquid in the handle. Yeah. But that doesn't really answer your question. Your question has to do with how does it happen, not when does it happen. You want the mechanism. Exactly. You want the nucleation mechanism. You already pointed out that it has to occur at a defect. Mm -hmm. Now the question is how does the bubble detach itself? What, what is the driving force? How does it depend on temperature, local environment, what happens? So you're probing it level of details that are beyond the handbook, beyond what is already known. And it seems to me that's exciting because you're not, you go beyond hydrodynamics, you go dynamics, and there's a whole world that you want to discover. Summarize, I, I cannot say it uh, be better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dennis, got a question? Quick, I've got a more practical question. OK, very nice. You do this nano engineering of the surface. How, how the heck did that ever survive at an actual real power plant? Is it, isn't this just going to be covered up or destroyed in an actual thermal environment? It's definitely a concern that it might be, for example, clogged by whatever you have inside the nuclear reactor. However, there are also ways of preventing those fouling things to accumulate on the surface. There's actually another thing we're collaborating with uh, Professor Short's group of how not only have those surfaces to improve CHF, but also prevent any staff that wants to stick to the surface from doing that. So there, there might be a chance there. Verdict's still out. We don't know yet. <laughs> but that's what we're trying. I saw one last question here somewhere. I think so. Um, so I just trying to understand the global dynamics here. So as they rise, um, so they can pull that stuff and, and give you bigger bubbles? Yeah. But are they always structurally stable? I mean, can they break? Yes. They there, can. Is, there is collapse and there is breakup. 
depends on turbulence, where the bubble is, depends on many things, yes. All right, let's thank Artyom once again.